Good evening, this is the Oscar Expert here with Brother Bro, and it's time to review Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. We're kind of late to the party. We're going to just free range talk about the movie, spoilers and all. Yeah, I mean, I could recommend the movie, but everybody clicking on the movie on the video has already seen the movie. I'm going to be very nitpicky because I feel like, you know, a, a film that people love and adore that is really, really good does deserve to be nitpicked as much as it deserves, you know, lots and lots of praise. So I hope it doesn't come across as like, I'm trying to take anything down. And I'm also just trying to work out some of my feelings on the film because superhero films are not like my forte. They're not what I go to the movies to see. Like, it's just like any other movie to me. Yeah, some people say, well, you're watching this movie like you're watching, you know, an Oscar caliber drama. And it's like, I am, I am. Yeah. It would sort of be insulting to say that it shouldn't be considered on that yeah. kind of level, right? But I did see the movie twice, so I feel like I have done my due diligence. The first one already changed the game for animated films, and this one just yet again ups its own bar. And the thing that they did differently in the first movie is that they took each environment and they gave its own, their own style to each one, they give their own color palette to each setting, or even to each scene or mood. This one bends the rules a little further. The interesting thing about the Spider-Verse is it's really an example where every single animator who worked on it had their own little bit of creative freedom. Unlike almost any movie that I can think of, this movie is just an amalgamation of so many people's vision. Yeah, because it feels like every shot might have its own expressivity. And it seems like animators get tasked to do like a certain, you know, few seconds of movie. And so every like 10 seconds of the movie is operating at like a 100 because that is that animator like giving their all to like their little contribution. And you just have over two hours of that level of effort. I love that the Gwen Stacy and father scenes were very expressionistic with their animation. The creators put a limitation on their animation that they're not gonna do any motion blur and they're not gonna do any blurred focus in the background. So in that scene, like they had to have these close-ups, but the background was supposed to sort of melt away. And I feel like they took that a few steps further to make the background completely expressionistic in these scenes. And I really love that they went in that direction because that is something I have never seen an animated film do, I think. Even just looking at how the colors were melting or evolving or shifting throughout the scene based on what was happening with the characters, that in itself made me feel emotional, like even regardless of the story almost. Because I don't even think there's actually that much story there. Like the, her and her dad, it's, it's sort of thin and, and obvious what's happening, but the colors, just enhance it to such a degree that I think a lot of people were really moved. Although I feel like those scenes push the expressionism really far, and I'm not quite sure it was working for me in every one of those shots. There's a shot reverse shot pair between Gwen and her dad where the background becomes like shapes and wheels and like pendulums, and I did not like that. It felt too out there and unmotivated. I didn't understand why they needed to do shapes. I thought the melting paint worked perfectly and they didn't really need to evolve it into like geometric, like almost mathematical looking patterns. Like there was a wheel behind her dad's head and I was like, why is there a wheel there? And also in the first scene with Gwen, her dad, when he almost like shoots her with his gun, the background for the dad becomes like an alleyway that isolates just him and his body. But the background is like black or just white and it looks like really in your face. I found that to be distracting as well. I feel like I want it to go in that direction. I like that it goes towards expressionism, but it was too much for me in some in some shots. I kind of get that, but I still think that it was very much worth it for them to go for that because right, I did I think that it resonated really, really strongly yeah. most of the time. But the colors on Gwen, like the blues and the purples, when, when, when her dad is like this warmth and, and those things like trying to connect and meet was like really powerful. Yeah, and they even did like trans colors on purpose to accentuate the idea that this is a coming out story. People on the internet pointed this out and I watched the movie thinking, People are probably reading into stuff, but then I was like, this seems unmistakably like that that is what it's doing. It's trying to make Gwen Stacy's story more universal by painting it with these colors. This is probably one of the most heavily stimulating movies I've seen and possibly one of the most visually stunning movies I've seen because literally just every single frame is just beautifully crafted and very expressive, even in scenes outside the Gwen Stacy universe it still felt like they were crafting the images to express like Miles' internal whatever is going on. Them sitting upside down with like the cityscape in the background is just a really beautiful scene. In a live action movie, two characters sitting on the bridge, it, it, it wouldn't impress me that much.
Like, the animation just really brings this movie to another level. It really makes Marvel pale in comparison when you think about their color palettes or lack thereof. It makes me wish that every superhero comic book movie could just be animated, maybe. Unless you're really going to give a director, like, some interesting creative freedom. I don't see why you, we shouldn't just animate all of them at this point. Definitely Like, why does. wouldn't you? And it's not even... The budget's not even... Higher, it's probably like it's, I think it's less expensive to do the to make Spider Verse than the typical Marvel movie. It feels like they were able to tell more story too because you can cram more information and more action into a, de a denser space with animation than you can with live action. What's happening is actually extremely complex, like the characters flying around, but somehow with animation you're able to understand that and digest it faster. I think because the movements would just be so impossible for like a live action film, like. There would be too much blurriness going on. You couldn't highlight single frames of action to make us feel like an impact. You know, it almost reinvents a language for doing like a superhero film, except for the fact that it's borrowing so heavily from comic books. And I think that the story is also above average for a comic book movie, you know, in, in this landscape of comic book movies. I really like all the time that it spends on Gwen Stacy's story and with her and her dad and with Miles and his parents. I was glad that we got even deeper into his relationship with his mom. And I thought in the first movie, his relationship with his dad and his uncle were some of the really strong parts. And I'm also really glad that they're bringing back the uncle because I thought in the first movie, that felt incomplete, the idea that his uncle like became the Prowler. And apparently he just rationalized it to himself. Like, yeah, he's a good guy, he just made some mistakes, but yeah, it, really, like, it huh? really begs like more of yeah, an explanation. I'm glad that we're gonna get to see yeah, I think but we're gonna get that. As is kind of the case with, you know, movies that Phil Lord and Chris Miller have a hand in producing and writing, like, it really is focused on the heart of the story, and that is what ropes me into the action. The core of the character to me in this movie seems to be that he is trying to break out of canon. He's trying to break out of the story that's being put upon him. That's with his parents, too, because his parents are like, this is how we want you to be as our son. This is how you, we want you to go to college. And these are the expectations that we have for you. He's having a parallel struggle with his own parents. I think he just mm -hmm. learns that the best he can do is to trust himself and be honest with who he is and let other I people guess. know who he is. And fight against restrictions that people are putting on him that don't feel right to him. It is most aptly exhibited with Gwen and her dad in the end. She has to give up that piece of her, which is like revealing that she's Spider-Man, which he's not supposed to do to her father. So she abandons her code and then he as a police officer abandons his code because that causes him to quit the force and he says i'm gonna put you above my job so you see it's like about humbling yourself to be somebody who exists outside of canon and code and just be like you okay so now that we've like parsed out the message as best as we can i have to say like i don't love it for both of my viewing experiences it didn't feel like that essential or that unique for this kind of movie. And maybe it doesn't have to. Like, the movie's great whether or not I resonate with this. The story's really exciting. It builds that tension in the end extremely well and gets me, like, really pumped for the next film. It has a lot of heartfelt moments. I think, like, all of the elements kind of tie in nicely. But it also feels, like, too easy to plug in, like, what we already know superhero movies look like into this story and be like, yeah, it's just, you know, it's how superhero movies movies go. I also am not like a huge fan of the message of like, yeah, you know, a superhero just has to trust his intuitions. You know, if Miles is sort of like doing that in his teenage naivete in the beginning and then he's sort of doing the same thing in the end, I don't know if it feels like he's come very far as a character. I do feel like he's definitely come around in, in the sense that he trusts his family suddenly. Um, he sort of takes another leap of faith, but you know, it doesn't feel like quite as strong as maybe like a film that's just a drama that doesn't have like any ties to superhero-ness or doesn't need to like entertain in like a big action sense. Ideally, I would want a story that's as deep as like a drama that I really love and then that would be like the best superhero movie to me. Like. Well, the best superhero movie to me is, is The Dark Knight. The Dark still. Knight, yeah. We both watched it recently and we both think it's like excellent. It does all the things that I want a superhero movie to do. Whereas this film, I feel like it does all the things that I expect a superhero movie to do and then it does other things like really, really well. I feel like the family stuff was almost there for me and I like that it is there, and I, but I want to see it more in the second film. I know that the scene with Gwen and her dad makes people cry, right? So let's just take that for example. It's a really easy conflict to understand and we don't know the specifics of their relationship and yet people cry. You know, as someone who didn't 
cry and didn't really get me even though I cried other movies I'm like what does that have going for people and like what it is is people project something onto that scene that they can relate to and they like fill it in and that's they get... every movie though I think it's a, it's especially movies that like do these things in a little bit more of like a thin way all it is in the movie is that Gwen can't come out to her dad because she is Spider-Man. Miles can't come out to his family because he is Spider-Man, and there's no other reason for it. It's just because he's Spider-Man. It's not like there's another layer to it where you can see how these parents and these children mm, are like I don't know if I missing disagree. each other. And I disagree with you. Miles is very much at odds with his parents in this movie. From his parents' perspective, he's just a kid who's like going out and getting into trouble too much. And I know it's because he's Spider-Man that he's getting out and going into trouble. Hiding these things from his family feels universal enough to me that it does... I think that that is true for most people too. And this is mostly just me parsing out my own feelings on it. But it's really like that scene where he's on the rooftop and he leaves his dad after his dad's like, I just want to know what's going on with you. And he's like earnest about it. He's like, just tell me like why you're not telling me something. Like, what is it? Because it's Miles' fault that they don't communicate as well because his parents are there for him. It's not like their egos are getting in the way necessarily. Yeah, but his parents are also understand. very tough on him and they want very specific things for his future. So yeah. if he tells them that the future that I want is not really what you have like in store for me, he thinks they're going to be upset. And I think the coming out thing, you know, it might be simple. It might be a simple coming out tale. But I think it ties into other pieces of the story. And so I wouldn't even look at it in isolation like that. There are some movies, like I think in The Suicide Squad, the thing with the rats, where she holds up the thing with the rats and everybody's supposed to cry, I feel like that's two, three minutes of the movie for, to actually get me. That's kind of what I felt like this movie was doing, but not as bad as that. Yeah. Where it's like, people will take all they can get from a superhero movie because they like superhero movies, and the, and the movie will do like a little bit, and then they'll be like, oh my god, it's doing all so much! But like, for me, I'll go watch a drama, and the drama does a lot. Because the drama actually, like, fleshes out conflicts and characters. But then in a superhero movie, what the superhero is going through is something that you, like, project your own things onto. And then you enhance it by, like, bringing real life into something that doesn't actually happen. I've definitely felt that way about a lot of superhero movies. But I can see in this movie that there is a lot of emotional material here. Yeah, I think they're trying harder and they're doing more than most movies. I can't decide if that's just me or not. Honestly, I thought Mitchell's vs. the Machines was a little bit more like that. I think that actually hit me more because that movie was a little bit more of a drama than Spider-Verse. Almost every scene was like very, very character focused. And I thought the specifics of her relationship with her dad were actually really interesting. So even though that movie is like not as flashy or impressive or groundbreaking, I think I do still like the Mitchells vs. the Machines more. It's definitely doing enough for I think for it's definitely like 90% doing percent enough. of people. But your evaluation of the movie is not on how well it works for 90% of people, it's on how well it works for you. Like for example, I really like that book that the original Spider-Man's reading when his kid is asleep. How to understand your child, how to communicate so your child understands you. I like that the parents are struggling with that. They feel like they can't quite understand, but the reason they can't understand is because their kid won't admit to them that they're Spider-Man. No, it's, I can't but, get over it. I no, can't. but the th it, like, if I say what I want to say, it's going to be exactly what I already said. It's just that that's such a universal experience. Sure, in this movie, the struggle of the teenager is that he's Spider-Man. But everybody's been through that with their parents, where it's tough to communicate. You know what? Maybe what it is is that I don't know what's gonna happen. Like, I, what are the Miles things gonna happen if he becomes if he comes out of Spider-Man? Parents will will be disappointed because I feel like not, I would not... connect with the movie if he came out of Spider-Man and his parents were like, Miles, like, oh my god, terrible. No, that buddy, happened. Like, with... you're gone. You're gone, buddy. That happened and then with they Gwen Stacy, bitch. Yeah. So that literally happened to Gwen Stacy. So we know the dangers that can come with coming out. Well, she that's like, that's like still a misunderstanding, he... though. That's still because he didn't understand that she did not kill, like, Spider-Man. Okay, sure. But I think for Miles, it's because his parents have a lot of put a lot of expectations on him. So yeah. if your kid is Spider-Man, then you, you, you can't, like, they, they're not going to be the kid that they thought that they had. I, I want to believe that that's going to be, like, really devastating. And maybe I'm just missing something, but I don't well, know if we'll, I feel uh, like We'll see, is. by the way. We, we still didn't get that part it, of the, the movie. It's sort of frustrating because a lot of the stuff that I'm saying, I feel like I will be unnecessary. It will be completely outdated once the next movie comes out, which I'm really pumped for. I do want to point out that I did like how this movie ties into the first one in terms of like continuing and building on that one's themes and I did like those little moments like where Peter Parker becomes a parent and then he tells Miles 
that he inspired him to become a parent. And there were like those, you know, few lines in the first one where he's like, you're making me want a kid a little bit. And I think it did a good job being a sequel to Enter the Spider-Verse. For the message that it wants to convey, which is well within like the realm of, you know, what we might expect from a Spider-Man movie or a superhero movie. Just for that though, it did emotionally resonate with me better than any other version of that story, probably just because yeah. it was like a really well done version of that story with the writing and just the animation and how that brought out all the emotions. One thing that I want to point out that maybe is nitpicky or maybe I'm gonna sound like, you know, I'm pulling a U. The part where Miles has to make a, a trolley problem decision where either he saves his dad or his entire universe goes to shit, or at least that's that's what Miguel tells him is gonna happen. It's an interesting scenario, but I don't think the movie is actually interested in exploring the implications of these sides. Because what's probably gonna happen is Miles is just gonna go save his dad and it's gonna be just fine because he's the anomaly. So it's not yeah. actually interested in exploring how somebody might choose something selfishly as opposed to the collective good. But again, it's just like, it doesn't really wanna go there. To Miles, this is presented as like, you either do what's in your gut, which is to save your dad, because he's your daddy, or you can save, like, a million people. And I don't think it's, like, heroic to be like, yeah, well, I'm gonna save daddy. Like, I don't think that in itself is heroic. But or I feel like the movie kind of wants you right. to think that but it is. But I think is. the movie wants you to feel like that's heroic. But really, to the audience, we know Miguel is just wrong. But it's not like Miles makes that decision by saying, hmm, I think that Miguel is actually incorrect because I am the anomaly, because he doesn't know that he's the anomaly yet. He gets that to reveal to that when Miguel's like yeah. fucking him on the train. <laughs> so that's another instance where like, I think it did a good job. Like it fleshed out more than it could have, but it didn't do like that much for me because I think at best a villain is so strong that as an audience person, you're like not sure who's gonna win because not only like, are you not sure who's more powerful, but you don't know whose ideas are actually better. Like I thought Thanos was compelling because there could be a scenario where wiping out half of people is better. I don't know that it's this scenario, but it's possible that that's true. And with Miguel, it's like, that is possible that he could be right. But we're not going to contend with the uh, with a world where Miguel is actually maybe right. We're not going to contend with that in Spider-Verse because, like, Miguel is just simply, like, mistaken. What I would really like to see in the next film, and this is where, like, I kind of leave it open because this could go in a different direction that makes me, like, kind of throw out, like, caring about that. Why did that happen for Miguel? And it's, why is it not going to happen for Gwen and it's not going to happen for Miles? That's what I wanna know. Yeah, I think that might answer that. I think maybe, I think maybe everybody's gonna be an anomaly in their own way. And everyone just thinks that, that could be a whole fun little the... cute message. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I would be interested if one of these Spider-Verse stories or a superhero movie in general were to actually explore the idea that maybe your moral intuition is not correct I think that's, that's what No Way Home kind of did. Because he was like, maybe me trying to do good things is just making things worse. And he was like, really like sitting with it. And he was like, fuck. Well, oh, fuck. that actually does. Oh yeah, shit. I fucked up my girlfriend from that. Well, shit. actually Spider-Man 2 did that too. I think all superhero movies contend with that idea. Like in some way they contend with utilitarianism versus like, you know, sticking to your moral intuitions. In these superhero films, what always happens is that the intuition of the hero just wins. It's sort of like a cop out. It's part of the reason why I don't like love these movies because they don't even need to like contend with it. They just know that that's where we want it to go because that's how we feel. We want that to go that way. We need to feel like our intuitions mean something and we can count on the superhero movies to affirm our own intuition. I think that that's why I love The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight made those two forces so formidable. One of them just barely ekes out over the other one, like just barely. Even though the Batman's like force wins, his has weakened and the Joker's force of chaos has grown. And so they end up like here. Where like the Joker's really powerful, but Batman's just a little more powerful. Bat and I feel like but everything Batman's ever all at once is like a good example of that too, because they make a really compelling case for like joy to like, why shouldn't I become like this monster? Why shouldn't I let my depression eat me? Why shouldn't my nihilism just eat me? She has really good arguments and Evelyn's just barely able to escape from that spiral as well. Like she just nearly falls into it because it's so compelling and she barely gets out of it. And it almost feels like, you know, it's made the absolute best case 
for both sides of this of this problem. And the reason I care about that problem is because it feels like close to my experience where like I actually care about how movies like solve these things because it is something that I think is interesting. Well, The Dark Knight's also interesting because Batman is calculating decisions not based on what his instincts would tell him. Otherwise, he would save Rachel instead of Harvey because he yeah. he loves Rachel, but but Harvey he thinks is the greater good choice. If the Joker weren't very challenging, Batman would be able to stick to his intuitions, right? And everything would be fine, and he could just abide by the laws as he is supposed to do, and everything's fine. But he forces Batman to go against law and order, like in order to uphold law and order. Showing that there's this sort of like faultiness within that system. Yeah, he exposes but, how fragile yeah, the he world is. The fragility of that. And even though Batman is able to secure hope for people in Gotham at the end of the movie, it still does feel like it's been exposed how goddamn fragile that was all along. It wasn't just villains like fighting each other in the end and going like, I am correct. You are correct. Like it's like Wonder Woman he has that. to. Yeah. <laughs> and also Eternals does this. Um, yeah. But like in The Dark Knight, <laughs> They outsource the problem to the people of Gotham. And oh, they yeah. actually let the people of Gotham, like, decide, like, are we good or evil? And the pe people of Gotham make that decision in a way that actually felt like, oh, that's kind of true. Their decision is so powerful to, like, abide by law and order and not succumb to, like, that, that great, great evil. Even at the, it's at the sake of personal self-sacrifice, like, right? Like, because if they were all utilitarians on the boat, they would all think, okay, well, one person has to blow up the boat. So, like... It should be us because we know one person has to do it. So they actually make like a really good case, better than even Batman could make for himself. And if they didn't want to make that case, then the Joker would have won. It was just a brilliant way to sell that, you know, beyond like, I have an opinion, you have an opinion. Like it felt like it was about something broad and great. In terms of my favorite superhero movies, Spider-Verse is definitely up there for yeah. just being like very, very good at the for kind for of, different reasons. Yeah, but Spider-Verse, I think, still operates within the type of superhero movie that like Marvel is trying to offer. Yeah. But just a very, very good one. But I also don't necessarily need every superhero movie to be super dark. So. Maybe it is what I'm advocating, but I feel like I don't necessarily need that. I think the Spider-Verse films actually made me even more okay with a superhero film just being really good for what it is. If it's going to do Spider-Man, it's going to do Spider-Man really well and make you care about what that represents. And I also think The Dark Knight does that. It gets to the core of what Batman is supposed to represent and it honors it. And I think Spider-Man's absolutely allowed to honor without like trying to subvert itself like that much. So, you know, I don't really like knock it for doing that. It's more of me just sizing up the villain because I feel like in principle, your, your best villain is someone who's like compelling to the audience. But we all know, the whole audience knows Miguel's just kind of wrong. So we're just like, all right, Spider-Man's got to get him. I mean, in general, I, I wouldn't personally like change the movie because I think it's like perfect for who it's trying to be for. You know, at the same time, I'm like rationalizing why I I feel like it's a four out of five for me on Letterboxd. Huh. So you give the movie an eight out of 10. I would like give the movie an eight out of 10. I think I give it like a really strong eight out of yeah, 10. Yeah, like a really strong eight out of 10, but it just didn't like personally connect with me or resonate with me in terms of like substance and message. But I think that I'm gonna like the third one the best. I have a strong feeling I'm gonna like the third one the best because I like when things really wrap up. Maybe I'll even think of this movie differently after the third one. Well, the third one was get the setup to the third one's getting interesting. Do you wanna talk about like whether we like that it's a part one? On one hand, I have not seen a as explicitly a part one movie as this because what I do it spends like the last 15 minutes doing nothing but setting up stakes, building stakes for the next movie. But I found that like really exciting. I was like having a great time having that tension built up in me. And I think it's like those last 15 minutes are a big reason why I think this is a really good movie. I don't think that the last 15 minutes setting up all this exciting stuff actually contributes to how good I think this movie is because that's all stuff where I'm like, Cool, cool, great, like, we'll, we'll, we'll see you next time. I was just glad that this movie had its own character arc. Miles coming out to his parents, whether or not we know, like, if they're gonna be okay with it or not, that is the character's climax. I'm glad it feels like we actually got one. But I still need that resolution. Like, if his main point in the movie is coming out to his parents and we don't get the resolution, well, that, that's, that's sort of a problem that's kind of the for clever, a standalone But movie. that's kind of the clever thing about the Gwen Stacy storyline is that we actually get a resolution in her storyline. That's true. Since we're already doing like a 30 minute video, I might even like to get more nitpicky and talk about the sound and the score. The score from Daniel Pemberton, I think is pretty great. I love when there's themes in scores and this does have one that's like, 
But I feel like that's a first half, to, and then it needs like a second half. So that's my nitpick number one with the score, because I get super nitpicky with scores. One thing I really loved is that Gwen Stacy is like drums, and I, I mean, maybe they could do, could have done it more even, because I loved it in the beginning. But like when she kicks into action in that scene when she defeats the vulture, they like start doing the drum kit, and I was like, that's great. I love this like drum kit theme for, for Gwen. That's perfect. When the scene when Spider-Man is talking to his dad, but his dad does not know that Spider-Man is Miles. I didn't love the music in that scene. It was just like too drum kitty, but I felt like it was supposed to be really sweet, but like the percussion took me out of that and I would have liked if it was just strings with no percussion under it. The music in Mumbai was fantastic and I think the music crescendoed in the end really nicely. Sound, the mixing, is more of a problem than people have been saying it is in that like people have been saying it's it's the first scene or so with Gwen Stacy when she's doing the voiceover and yes it's definitely a problem in that scene it's very obviously a problem because her dialogue is hard to understand this film has a problem throughout with its sound mixing. The whole movie's low. Like, I don't know why or how this happened, but the whole movie seems low to me. All the trailers were like just the right sound. It felt like more dynamic. It felt like it had more range and more volume. And this just didn't. It was really a shame because sometimes I felt like the music was supposed to be more powerful and like getting me pumped up. And I just could, couldn't hear it as well. It was a problem that they never used ducking. They would have a music track playing. And if there's voiceover with it, those two levels don't move. So the, uh, the music just quiet the whole time even though even when there's no voiceover or no, no dialogue going over it just so that when there's dialogue the dialogue's louder but like what it should be doing is when the music is there and no dialogue it should be high music and then when the dialogue comes up the music should duck down and it did not do that in many scenes and it was very annoying for me and I wish there was more attention to the sound as there was to the visuals like it felt like the sound was passing but mostly it used music to fill in the noise and it did not use sound to like fill in the worlds that much it was mostly music yeah it really really relied on the score which I think you can do if like it, you know you're really gonna put that much craft into the score yeah the score is fucking loud and layered and you can't put a bunch of sound effects on top of that I guess that's just true is like they just chose score over doing like some intricate sound stuff but I wouldn't have minded a little bit of variety we're like maybe some scenes we just get sound and just see what that's like it feels yeah. like we didn't really try to experiment with that the score is pretty interesting though because there are not a lot of movies that rely this much on like break beats and super blary, sour, bit crushy synths. The score is pungent. I like scores that are not trying too much to be in the background where they don't really have that much character like most Marvel movies. So yeah, I like the score a lot. And those are many various random thoughts on Spider-Verse two weeks late. You can tell us why we're wrong and why the correct opinion is to love this movie unconditionally. Um, unconditionally. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Did you think it was the best movie you've ever seen?